Kentucky Kingdom is an interesting amusement park in Louisville. This park is one of the best in the country for ejector airtime, but it wasn't always like that. Kentucky Kingdom is a very turbulent history. The park has had multiple owners, and it even closed at points. But today, it's a solid amusement park. Find out everything you need to know about this park in this review. Before delving into this park's history, it's important to note where this park is located. Kentucky Kingdom is located in downtown Louisville, roughly one mile from the airport. While it is super cool seeing planes fly overhead, this has imposed strict height limits on the park. Kentucky Kingdom can build taller rides, but only in specific spots in the park. This park was also built in the grounds of the Kentucky Fair and Exposition Center. The initial owners leased the land from the fairgrounds, which would cause problems down the road. Kentucky Kingdom originally opened in 1987 as a small 13-acre park. The ride lineup consisted mostly of kiddie and family rides, but the park struggled financially and filed for bankruptcy. Ed Hart purchased Kentucky Kingdom in 1989 and reopened it a year later. Over the next four years, Kentucky Kingdom was one of the fastest growing parks in the country. Attendance increased tenfold under his ownership. Hart exercised an option to lease an extra 13 acres to double the park's size. Hart believed roller coasters drove attendance, so five roller coasters were added. This include a classic wood coaster and thunder run, a Vacoma boomerang and vampire, one of the first Vacoma SLCs in T2, and the world's largest stand-up coaster at the time in Chang. The park also received several notable flat rides and a water park. Premier Parks purchased the park after the 1997 season and renamed the property Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom. The park continued to receive steady investment over the next decade, but there are three issues that stunted the park's growth and compromised its future. First, there was a tragic accident on Superman Tower of Power in 2007. One of the cables broke on this Intamin drop tower, and it became entangled around a young girl's legs, causing both her feet to be amputated. This understandably generated a lot of negative publicity for the park and severely impacted attendance. Second, Six Flags tried to amend the lease with the Kentucky State Fair Board. They want more clarity in the long-term stability of the park, but the board declined. This is one of the reasons Chang was ultimately relocated to Six Flags Great Adventure. Third, Six Flags filed for bankruptcy in early 2010, and they immediately ceased operations of Kentucky Kingdom because of the lack of clarity in the land. Six Flags gutted the park, taking a few rides, ride parts, all DC and Looney Tunes theming, and some infrastructure items like shade structures. Multiple proposals to revive the park failed over the next few years, including one from the owners of the nearby Holiday World. But in 2012, Ed Hart returned to the park he saved one and a half decades before, and he did the same thing again. Hart's proposal would invest $120 million into the park, making it a premier amusement park destination once again. Kentucky Kingdom reopened in 2014 with new additions on both the amusement and water side. The park received three new roller coasters since reopening, all of which excel at airtime. Lightning Run came first in 2014, Storm Chaser came second in 2016, and then Kentucky Flyer came third in 2019. While the latter didn't offer the extreme ejector airtime like the predecessors, it had about as much airtime as you could reasonably expect on a family coaster. In early 2021, Hershen purchased the park. Hershend is two of the best theme parks in the country in Silver Dollar City and the nearby Dollywood, and these two parks have received heavy investment. But some of the other properties like Wild Adventures have received much less attention. Thus far, the only thing Kentucky Kingdom has received is the chain's beloved cinnamon bread, but time will tell if they get significant ride additions down the road. While the park's long-term prospects finally seem stable, Kentucky Kingdom has a bizarre setup. It starts with a parking lot. The roadway into the amusement park is shared by the Expo Center, so it's extremely easy to end up in the wrong parking lot and then you can get confused how to exit the property. The park layout is also bizarre. A road cuts through the center of the park, so the park is split into two sections. You get between the two sections by either crossing over it via a bridge or using the manned crosswalk. It is so weird having to watch for traffic in the middle of a theme park. The ride placement is odd too. The Hurricane Bay water park is plopped down smack dab in the middle of the amusement park. It is impossible to access the coasters in the back of the park 
without cutting through the water park. However, it thankfully doesn't take too long to get between attractions, so it's only a minor nuisance. Now let's talk about the aesthetics. The front two-thirds of the park look great. Rides and slides sport fresh and vibrant color schemes. There really isn't any theming, but the park looks clean and nice. However, I do not like the back section of the park. The area by Storm Chaser looks hideous, and the pathways leading back there feel empty and desolate. While the front areas feel lively, this back section feels like a post-apocalyptic wasteland. I really hope this section gets aesthetic improvements under Hershen's guidance. This park also does not have much shade. Under Hart's ownership, they used to provide free sunscreen, but that perk seems to have been discontinued, so plan accordingly or you can get burned. Literally. Another practice that seems to have been discontinued was the free soft drinks. Now you need to purchase either a souvenir cup or a season pass. I mentioned how Hershen brought their cinnamon bread to Kentucky Kingdom, but my favorite food here is the soft pretzels by Lightning Run. These homemade pretzels are super doughy and buttery. I can't speak to the park's other entrees because I always fill up on pretzels. They are amazing. Prices seem similar to the pre hershen days, as daily admission costs $50 as of 2022, but you can cheaply add a second consecutive day for $5 more. Season passes are also very affordable, at just $65 to $80, depending on the tier. Because these passes include parking and some additional discounts, it may honestly be a better deal just to get the season pass even if you're visiting for just one day. If your primary focus are the roller coasters, you want to be one of the first people in the park and immediately ride Lightning Run. This coaster often runs just one train and it tends to have slow dispatches due to the unaccommodating restraints. Shortly after opening, this ride often has a 30 minute wait. You then want to head towards the back of the park. T3 is shaky, but if you want to ride it, head there next because it can only run a single 14 person train. That coaster often has the longest line in the park by midday. The other coasters usually have minimal weights. Thunder Run and Roller Skater because of popularity, Storm Chaser because of its isolated location in the back of the park, and Kentucky Flyer because it has the fastest operations in the park, and it's the one coaster that routinely runs two trains. The tube slides can get busy in hot summer days, so if these are a priority for you, it is prudent to experience those early. As I mentioned earlier, Kentucky Kingdom is a must for airtime lovers. There are six coasters in total, with three being bona fide airtime machines. Storm Chaser is my favorite of the bunch. This Rocky Mountain construction hybrid conversion of the former Twisted Twins wood coaster is powerful. While this is one of the smallest RMCs, this one typically runs shockingly fast, delivering some of the strongest ejector airtime of any coaster. I love the sustained airtime on the first Camelback, and the final few hills violently pop you out of your seat. My review on this coaster occurred after the 2020 season, but my rides in 2021 and past years were more powerful than the one I described. Lightning Run is the Chance Piper GTX prototype, and it rides like an RMC. The ride is glass smooth while offering strong ejector airtime. The returning bunny hills are the standout moment for me. They occur in rapid fire succession, and the ride tries to catapult you to the moon. It really is a shame that Chance hasn't built more of these yet. Kentucky Flyer is the park's best family coaster. It has a low height limit and every hill pops you out of your seat. The ride isn't too extreme, which makes it approachable for younger guests, but the abundance of airtime makes it enjoyable for older riders as well. And I also love how the ride looks like a classic wood coaster with a white support structure and its placement on the park's perimeter. Thunder Run may be the best DIN coaster out there. That outward leg delivers some nice airtime too. The second half fizzles out due to all that straight track, but thanks to recent track work, this wood coaster is pretty smooth now. But you know what ride isn't smooth? T3. This ride is so notoriously rough that even the park's own social media team insults this ride. No, really. This was one of the prototype SLCs. Being one of the oldest is extremely shaky. The new trains from Kumbach do eliminate headbanging, but the restraints are super tight in your thighs and the ride shuffles you about mercilessly. Ride this one at your own risk. For younger guests, you have a Vacoma Junior Coaster and Roller Skater. It's smooth and comfortable for guests of all ages. The rest of the lineup is mixed. You have a 5D theater, but no traditional dark rides. Most of the flat rides are towards the front of the park. You have a solid collection of spinning rides, 
and three newer flats worth checking out. The best of the bunch is Fearfall. This Larson drop tower offers a very forceful drop with zero warning. You levitate the whole way down and you get one heck of a stomach dropping sensation. Cyclos is a Zemperla inverting frisbee that offers good positive G's in the downswings and great hang time on the full revolutions. Skycatcher is an armed star flyer that offers a mildly forceful ride experience plus some of the best views of the park. For kids, you have a sizable kitty area known as King Louis Playland. There aren't too many rides for them in the back half of the park though, but this section towards the front has plenty of attractions to keep younger guests busy for a few hours. There are two water rides on the dry side. Mile High Falls is one of the largest shoot the shoots rides in the world. This Hopkins creation stands 90 feet or 27 meters tall, so you have a thrilling plunge and a resultant splash that's soaking and ginormous. You also have an okay River Rapids ride in Raging Rapids. It doesn't get you too wet, but it does have a long course. Now for many years, this attraction was better known for a particular rock formation that looked like a male body part, but it has since been removed. A moment of silence for our fallen comrade. Hurricane Bay is a pretty good water park. There is a strong collection of tube slides, plus two standout attractions. First is Deep Water Dive. This is one of the tallest speed slides in the world, standing 121 feet or 37 meters tall. It is taller than any of the park's roller coasters. This slide is an absolute rush between the height and suspense from that trap door falling out. Second is Deluge. This is a great water coaster. This one is a series of sizable drops, giving some solid air time. However, it is extremely unreliable. This was the prototype ProSlide Hydromagnetic Water Coaster, and I honestly don't know the last time it ran. Beyond the rides and slides, you also have a sea lion show. I have never seen it, but it seems quite popular with guests, and it's a pretty rare offering for an amusement park like this. So do I recommend Kentucky Kingdom? Yes I do. This park has a small but strong coaster lineup. Storm Chaser and Lightning Run are two of the best coasters for ejector airtime. They will launch you out of your seat. The park also has some solid supporting rides, and most of the park looks good. If you only do the amusement side, you may only need a half day at Kentucky Kingdom. I often hit this park before or after Hollywood Nights because it's just one hour from Holiday World. If you do plan to hit the water park, Kentucky Kingdom is probably a full day park. Whether I do the water park depends if Deluge is operating, which it hasn't happened since my first visit to the park in 2016. So those are my thoughts on Kentucky Kingdom and Hurricane Bay. What are your thoughts on this amusement park? Do you think Hershen's ownership will be a good thing? Let me know what you think about this park, whether it be the rides or this park's convoluted history down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you consider subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.